One year in the making. Hello, everybody. How you doing today? Hey, what's up, Ronnie? Hello. Ah, uh, yes. Hello. Ronnie. What a Hello. good name. Well, so... I guess I'll start with just a brief explanation of what this is. So this is the first of two podcasts that we're doing today to celebrate the one-year anniversary of our existence. So you guys who have been listening to us since the start, uh, thank you and also sorry because we suck so bad. But hey, it's been a fun time so far. So this first podcast is... The people I have with me right now were not part of the original Little Busters group because we've grown into more than just a group of like, man, what was it, seven people or something? We, we have grown quite a bit. So the folks among us right now, they joined after, but they've finished their Little Busters. They know the story of Little Busters and all that. And since that was the first thing they did, and no, it's the first thing we did, that's what we're going to talk about. So let's see. Let's go. Let's go down this list again. Austin, hello, regular man. Hello. I'm so happy to be on this anniversary podcast. Almost didn't make it. <laughs> and how about Baku? Hello. I have no idea what's going on. Really? I think that might be a problem. Yeah. <laughs> I do actually. But it's going to be like, oh well. You'll I have to. Be funny. You'll have to wing it even harder than you normally do. All right, I'm fully prepared. <laughs> All right, and let's see. New guy corrupted. Still alive. For now. Maddie. I'll, I'll be here for the good bit. Yeah. He's our glue eating champion today. And from across the pond, Mr. Proto. Hello. Yes. Glad hello. to be here on a on an actual podcast. On an with actual the podcast. The Kalkarawa. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh. Although that was a masterpiece. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> it was an Everyone go, masterpiece. Everyone go watch the Nekopara podcast. Yeah. yeah shout out to that. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to our own work. <laughs> link link in the description. Well, all right. I uh, I guess we could just get started. I almost wanted to delve into the old way that we used to do things, where I would just talk for a long time, like, with Discord muted. <laughs> my intros for that used to be bad. I almost whipped out my old webcam mic and just had the god-awful audio quality of last time, just for kicks. But, uh, yeah, it's... <laughs> I, you should do I decided, that on the next one. I decided against... No, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I, I decided against that. So, I guess... Yeah, we might as well just get started. So, let's see. I suppose, first on the list... Man, I should have done a poll. I guess, first on the list, we'll, we'll talk about... We'll talk about Kamari. Because her route uh, is the only route that you don't get locked out of. You, you, nothing nothing changes with her route or anything like that so I guess yeah I guess just uh we'll start talking about Kamari what did y'all think of her route her character her character development what'd you guys think of all the brutes um and of all the focuses um well, you can say to an extent that um, a lot of what a lot of little busters is about is about loneliness and getting over that loneliness via the little busters. However, in terms of Kamari, that is that element is not as much there. Um, well, you have her trauma about what happened with her brother, of course, and um, and yeah, yeah, that was that was an interesting thing that I sort of thought about only a couple of days ago, to be honest. It's just been ages since I've finished the Kamari route. Well, I think Kamari's route is very predictable, but one of the main themes of Little Busters is maturity and uh, overcoming your weaknesses, and I think Kamari's route does a good job of setting that up, uh, which is why it works as a good starting route. Uh, Kamari uh, accepting that her brother is no longer with her is the final 
bit of her route and it shows you that th this is what Little Busters is gonna be. All these characters, they have something that happened in their past and they need to somehow get over it. Well, get over it sounds a bit harsh. <laughs> Corrupted, what uh, did you think of the route? Eh, I have a hard time remembering it. I don't think it did the most for me, but that uh, common route scene where you see your panties was pretty cute. I would expect nothing less from you. <laughs> yeah, this... Of all the routes, there is not much I can say about it, which, um... I guess we picked I a good one to start on. <laughs> Baku, did you have uh, any comments to make? Uh, yeah. Komari was my first real route in Little Busters, which was actually my first key VN, so I kind of have some sort of bias towards it. Because it introduced me to how key stuff works. I mean, hey, and, even if you're biased, you can feel free to talk about what you liked and disliked. Yeah, I like most things about the route. I, some of her character development, to me, was really good. It, and uh, her route in general was just something I could really sympathize with. And as a sort of introduction to how this key stuff works and all that and what to expect from them, I think it was... A really good introduction and how it compares to the other routes is like mm, I don't really have any strong feelings on the route when compared to the others yeah and I mean I suppose that would probably be because Komari and Haruka's routes are as I like to say the most grounded in realism so they're probably not going to leave as much of an impact Unless you can, like, personally relate to some parts of them. Because they don't rely on, you know, the, the famous key magic that so many key routes rely on. So, and, and I've noticed that throughout the past year, as I've talked to people about Komari's route, is that a lot of the people who really, really liked her route had some sort of personal connection to it. You know, it wasn't just a key route to them. They, they really, they they felt it, for lack of a better way of putting it. It resonated with them. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Couldn't have said it better myself. Didn't say it better myself, actually. I think the only thing that resonated with me was the bad ending. I really like how they just kind of spaced out and accepted it. So one of the problems I have with the route is that Kalmari as a standalone character isn't anything special. She was a much better character in her dynamics with the rest of the characters, especially Rin in the later parts of Refrain. But in her own route, uh, didn't really feel anything strong about her character. And as you said, since I myself did not resonate with that route, uh, I didn't feel anything special from the route as a whole. Yeah, she does work as a supporting character rather than a main character, I'd say. Um, with the exception, of course, in her roots. Um, I don't know if I remember correctly, she does pop up in the other roots quite a lot, especially in Rinsu, that we'll talk about later. You know, and that, and, um, that was a thing I enjoyed about Little Busters as a, as a whole, is that even, you know, even during the heroin routes, this is still a story about a group of friends. So Little Busters is unique-ish. I know, you know, it's not a, it's not groundbreaking because other visual novels do it, but the heroines tend to not completely disappear altogether once you go <laughs> down a heroin route. I mean, obviously they show up a bit less because you're spending more time with one heroine, but in a lot of past key games and just visual novels in general, as soon as you're on a route, the majority of the cast just shows up hardly ever or disappears altogether. Yeah, exactly. And that's, um, but some of the roots that we'll talk about later, that's particularly for me, a quite a big aspect of why I liked, um, some of the other roots I'll talk about, Kurugaya and, um, Kanata, uh, to be specific. Yeah. So what did we think of Komari as a character? Well, Rennie, I know you hate her. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't about me. This isn't my podcast. Oh, well. Um, as I said, I don't feel anything special about her. Um, I've done, like... I've done key character rankings using, like, uh, this... 
uh, algorithm on Tumblr, and Kamari consistently ends up uh, very, very near the bottom. <laughs> but I think that's that's just. I mean, I don't, I don't hate her. Uh, there are actually very, very few key characters that I actually dislike. I just have uh, no. It's just, she doesn't stand out to me much at all. Uh, outside of her dynamics with other characters, which are, you know, touching at best. Right, and for but me, she's, but she's forcing um, um, Yuiko to... But she's calling um, oh, Yuiko yeah. Yui-chan. Yui-chan. And the epic battle that commences. <laughs> Komari Max. So, yeah, my whole thing with Komari, she's a lot like Tezuka Rin from Kadawa Shoujo for me, in that in, in, in one part of the game i just i can't stand her and then in the other part of the game i really like her so in in her route komari has a lot less of her i i really don't know how to describe it but like all of her dialogue has like tildes and all of her like voice lines are like whatever but i i can't stand that but she does it a lot less in her route so like Tezuka Rin, I sort of separate them. Common route Komari, I can't stand. Komari route Komari, I kind of like her. I do have to make a confession. Um, I do have her turned down to like almost zero. <laughs> <laughs> My little bus. No one will blame. <laughs> yeah. I don't blame me for that. For, for the sake of my ears. A few people do. Them. And yeah, it's a... Uh, I've been having a rough time because I'm playing Fruit of Grisaya, and her voice actress is Principal Chizuru. So anytime Chizuru starts to whine about something, it's like, uh, no, remember, Rinny, this isn't Komari, it's okay. Because it's, it sounds it's still not exactly okay. Like Chizuru is also not a great character, but this isn't the Grisaya podcast. <laughs> yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll shit on Chizuru next week. Uh, for me, Komari as a character, like, I know I kind of said i was indifferent on her route in general when compared to the others but just looking at her like by herself i really like her kind of character just the kind of sweet innocent type and with the fact that she loves sweets and all that it was like you're oh a, this is a really sweet character you're I really a fan love of her. the way uh <laughs> some of that can get kind of grating at times but overall as a character i really like her i will agree that common route kamari can kind of get unbearable at times. The best part of Common Route Komari is hitting her with a baseball. <laughs> <laughs> there are yeah, points I where I agree with you on that. I think I agree with Baku here. Uh, Komari, uh, as a character, does hit a lot of things I would generally like. Just in Komari, uh, didn't really do it for me. Yeah. Give me like, Chamba. Komari Route Komari, it's like. I'm a very emotionally fragile person, so when someone like her like goes through something like that in a route, I look at her more as a character and I analyze her behavior and stuff when I'm doing other routes, and it kind of leaves a lasting impact on me. Oh. And it kind of hits me harder when it's a character that I really like and can sympathize with. So this is something I don't like about myself as a person, uh, so, so I know it's going to sound a bit harsh. but. Um, unless it's just done magnificently, I have just always detested characters that put themselves in a psychosis to avoid having to deal with their past. And like, well, I mean, I can accept that, but then dragging other people into that psychosis only to have them find out it's all just, it's all not real, uh, really puts me over the edge. And I don't know, I just find myself unable to sympathize with most of those kind of characters. So... Then, well, then I here we go. Let's have a podcast debate. What do you think Komari dragged Ricky in for? I, I, I don't feel that at all. I don't feel Komari dragged him into anything. Well, let's see. She pulled him around trying to find out about her brother when she should know perfectly well that he's gone. To be fair, she was like five. True. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, that's the whole thing. She's in a psychosis. She should know he's gone, but she doesn't. And I feel it's a lot more on her parents for just sort of allowing it to happen rather than just, um, rather than having her face reality head on as you click on the, yeah, on the, the fact that you 
guys can come up with these logical reasons against what I just said is the reason why I say this is something I you know dislike in myself because I know I should uh, have, I should feel sympathy for these kinds of characters but I just can't <laughs> Maybe. so so the, the lesson of Komari's route is Austin's a dick <laughs> basically I think it's a uh, I think because I don't know I've never really had too much trouble um, overcoming those kinds of things in my own life so I, I don't know I just uh, I can't empathize with these kinds of characters because I've never I've never felt the way they do mental illness is hard to sympathize with unless you've experienced it yourself mm -hmm. empathize yeah how true that is yep <clears throat> all right well any last thoughts on Komari chan she's way too tall she's way too tough how the hell does she win the contest all the fucking time? <laughs> that fucking donut. Yeah, she she has <laughs> roid <laughs> donuts. How she beat Masato and Kyosuke like three times for the last yeah. time I played through. She just wrecks. Like she whips out like a ball and chain or something when no one's looking and just wrecks. <laughs> that paper craft castle ain't nothing to mess around with. <laughs> yeah, not with not with Komari. All right, so who next? You know, let's just. I'm gonna follow. I'm gonna follow the music order. So next up, let's talk about the best Haruchin. Yes. <laughs> oh boy. Proto's a big Haruka boy, and I can respect it. I can tell. So the, the Genki girl. The Genki what, girl will always be best girl. What did we eyes. think of Dear Sagusa Haruka? God, I loved her. Her out was among the top rankings for me. It was really good. Same. Yeah, and as, as, as I said earlier, hers is the other route that's most rooted in realism. You know, like, it's obviously it's not realistic to think that you can develop twins from two separate dads. I mean, I think it's technically possible. Uh, I didn't totally look into it, so... I need two eggs from yeah. a woman, which is very, very rare yeah. for her to yeah, I, I think it's a possible thing, but incredibly unlikely. But it's a visual novel, who cares? Um, Their parents use key magic. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, they both, uh, the guys had key magic dicks, or she had a key magic womb, something like that. <laughs> but, I, and the other thing I don't like, and Key seems to enjoy doing it, and I don't know about other visual novels because I haven't played that much, but... Really? They're twins, but their eyes are starkly different colors, really? Yeah. I thought that, that was kind of silly. Seeds. Yeah, that's that's just as unlikely as their existence. It's not even... yeah. <laughs> it's not how biology works. Yeah. That being said, uh, they're both really pretty, but whatever. <laughs> just don't think about it. <laughs> that's oh, what I do a lot with Renault Busters. <laughs> just don't just think about it. Just turn off your brain and everything will be fine. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, at least for me, when I first met Haruka, that's what I had to do. I could not stand her from the start. I just, yeah, I turned off my brain. As soon as I heard her song, I was like, nope, I'm just going to go catatonic and wake up when she's gone. Because Genki Girls, and I, I remember saying this during the Haruka podcast, um, Genki Girls, they just, they, they wear me down. I'm not a fan of that type of character but as I played through Haruka's route and the fact that she went through some actual development she wasn't the same Haruka as when you first meet her led to a whole new appreciation because as mean as it sounds it was really nice putting up with her during the other common routes or the other routes knowing that part of it is just kind of an act you know, I, yeah. it, it was refreshing knowing that, oh, you actually aren't an obnoxious piece of shit all the time. So, for me, uh, I really like this route because it brings me back to uh, my favorite key novel, Canon, and one of my favorite routes in Canon my that God, deals with... <laughs> yeah! <laughs> no. Um, the... It's... Shiori's route that also deals with two sisters in conflict for reasons they cannot control. And just a story of seeing, and it doesn't have to be sisters, it can be brothers, brother and a sister. Uh, siblings. Just, the yeah, word just, is siblings, Austin. 
I was going to continue with parents and children and family. Just, the word is family. family. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, there you go. I was, I was getting there. Uh, just two family members in conflict with each other for reasons they cannot control, and just seeing them uh, overcome that through uh, not at all civil speaking. Lots of uh, give me all the cat fights. Just as long as they're friends at the end. That's a yeah. weird way to put it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, know. I, I love, I love seeing scenes of them just like you know ripping each other's hair out and then being like, "Okay, you good? Yeah, I'm good." I so why do you like Haruka's route? Well, I love me some cat fights. I tell you what. <laughs> That's that broken benches. Up, man. New guy corrupted. You got any thoughts on Haruchin? I do. Let's hear him. She, she felt the route felt very real to me. I think my interpretations of her is a little different. To me, she felt like a loser. She feels like oh. a kind of a kind of person that doesn't have anything going for her. Every other heroine has a unique attribute. They're smart. They're loving. They're sweet. They're thoughtful. They're strong. Haruka's Haruka gonna spend nothing. the next Haruka fifteen has a, has years a wearing a neat sweatshirt. Haruka has a big pair of tits. That's all she's got going for her. She has and the piece in her hair. She also <laughs> has the most amazing soundtrack. I when she jumps in with the bubbly soundtrack, I just woke up. I was Man, like, melancholy of a noisy like, girl. I love it. I just I cannot get over how awesome her bubbly soundtrack is. But the fa but I feel like it really took that this is a loser theme and just reinforced it all the way to the end of the game to the final final scenes where it's like what well, who is it? Rin who was like if you if you choose the ending that isn't Rin, Rin kind of gives her assessment of every character and even she's like well, I've said something nice about everything, everybody, but Haruku, there's nothing for me to say nice about her, but whatever, you can be included too. <laughs> well, Haruka, and <laughs> you existed, and that was cool sometimes. But because of that, it felt more like a real person to me. It felt like when you're spending time with her, it's like, shit, I don't feel anime magic. I feel like this is a real person with real trashy, wh like, white trash problems, and I really get into that. I, I, I really enjoyed the fact that it felt so real, and it felt depressing being with her. Like you were just distracting each other physically from bigger problems. So that's my interpretation for her. I really enjoyed what a loser she was. It was endearing. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, you know, biological atrocities, that's pretty white trash there. <laughs> well, it actually got very Japanese as soon as it got arranged marriages. And that's fucking disturbing as hell. But like, in my mind, I translate it to, to trailer trash. Just something I'm familiar with. I have to say, um... With the exception of being intelligent, um, I think a lot of people can agree that she isn't exactly the brightest um, person in the room. She's she, she's loving. She's um, she's friendly uh, to a very annoying extent, but still friendly. Um, and I suppose she does care about her friends, um, but she, she does sort of. Um, she does sort of require them as a sort of tether. Um, to, to, to sanity. Well, she's a loser and she knows it, and so she's very down on herself, and I think those kind of characters are meant to build your ego, and I'm definitely a sucker for that. Yeah. Listen, yeah. anybody who tops their pancakes with mayonnaise is a loser. I'm sorry, did you all feel called out by that? <laughs> yes. I feel personally <laughs> attacked. <laughs> so I then, I, I guess... We we sort of combined that one. We 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 talked about her route and her character all together. That was actually pretty nice and fluid. Any uh, any other things to say? I still hate Takata by the end. Um, <laughs> I, I still fucking I sorry I shouldn't swear, but I still fucking hate her. Yeah, um, no, I mean she, I, I felt the same way. Until... Like her actions were justified, but that doesn't change the fact that she still handled the situation like a fucking idiot. She just went, she went too hard. I know she's trying to push Haruka away and keep up this act as we it's looked some, in some more in the Carnival Roots. Um, I, after reading that, I really sympathize with that. But if the experts didn't exist, it the story would have felt a bit incomplete, in my opinion. Um, justice needs to be done for what the Saigusas and the Futakis did to those twins. And... Um, Although we do get that in the Kamasa route, um, I'm sort of thankful that we did. <laughs> I have a hard time bouncing back from her being literally Hitler. 
Yeah, I think that was the best part of Haruka's route for me was her interactions with Kanata. Like, the writing with her God, the way was. Pronounced names kills me. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm a country hick. Kanata. Uh, just their interactions, the way they were written, was really good. Like, I absolutely despised her. And I think that's what they wanted me to do, and it worked really well. Oh, yeah, and she's totally written that way. Yeah, like scenes with the bench and the rumors being spread around. It's like, oh my god, I want to punch this bitch in the face. And then the bad end. Got the bad end. Oh, dude, I, that's actually uh, where I was going to go next. Yeah, How would y'all like old. the bad end, where Haruka literally throws herself into yeah. traffic? Yeah, just fucking slit my throat now, please. I felt really bad for not realizing that was kind of... So I was like, mint? So I was like... Just... When she when Ricky spelt um, mint in her uh, in her house, I'm like, oh, that's weird. And then I just all sort of dismissed that. Um, and then the bad route comes along and just hits me like a truck, and I felt really guilty. Oh. Yeah, that's certainly yeah. a way to make your heart <laughs> drop. Hit you like a truck, hit, you like a truck just like that truck hit Haruka. Brought her into another world. <laughs> yeah, just hit the reset button. To be fair. True. Sure. Nah, oh, man, imagine so if it didn't, painful. though. Imagine if that, like, fucked up Kyosuke so hard that he couldn't hit the reset button. Are, are we actually uh, discussing um, Hitler's route now, too? No. No, that comes after Refrain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll wait. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Hitler. Um... Alright, so, so then, let's see here. Next up, who do we got next Oh, I have something up? I want to say. Oh, okay. So, uh... So I'm here. Uh, I watched the anime first. Hello, please, please flame me. <laughs> uh, so there, are, so because Haruka's route is so long, uh, there's a lot that's cut out of it from the anime. Um, uh, one of those things is the scenes where Haruka runs away to be with her family for a bit, and she finds out. Uh, some stuff that uh, Kanata might know about their parents. Uh, that's completely cut out of the anime, and instead it's changed to Haruka's just like, Hmm, I think Kanata might know something. Let's go check it out. Like all Scooby-Doo style. And let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah. He here's a good one. That makes Kan- that makes Kanata, like, even more hateable. You almost said so Kanata. You almost became Baku. I'm sorry. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of hard. <laughs> It's hard, okay. Leave me alone! <laughs> so, um, there's that scene where, uh, that, well, you know, there's that bench. I don't remember what was going on with that bench. But after that, um, there were rumors going around that Haruka and Riki were, you know, getting it on. And that's, that's not okay to be doing at school. But they didn't want to have those, uh, those, you know, sexual implications in the anime so instead they changed it to haruka fix the bench and we can't have that no and that's that's punished. a visual novel thing it is really yes <laughs> yeah yeah the bench is literally a plot line and they destroy it it is but in the anime that's just the sole reason why haruka gets punished instead of coming up with other things against her like all the rumors and such there's like nope if you fix this bench you're an awful student no I'm, pre I'm, I'm pretty much that i'm pretty sure that's the sole reason in the visual novel too yeah i remember it being that way wow so yeah uh, uh, so oh, did uh, everyone think of oh, yeah, Kana, um, Kana's an awful person not just in the anime what did everyone think of the romance between Ricky and Haruka? I, I really sort of felt it was a bit. It. I think it was. Really I thought it was a bit forced. Definitely, I don't know. Definitely uh, a pity boner. Yeah, it is a pity boner to be honest. But <laughs> all I know is the <laughs> CG where she's like smiling with tears in her eyes after smooching Ricky. It's one of my favorites, like in the yeah. whole game. That was some good shit. When a girl comes to you and has like no family or friends or anyone that loves her in the world, it's hard to say no. Yeah, true. <laughs> I feel like I'm the only one with a pure love for Haruka here. I'm like, oh, I, I like her, but I pitied her first, so whatever. What? Wait, what? what I love that first. It was love at first sight. <laughs> it was. Love I love at first it's sight, more than yours, really. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I yeah, was same. with Rin. 
as soon as I saw how socially awkward she was, I was like, <laughs> hello. I feel like so when you've I got the, the rest of that harem, and then you choose Haruko, I have like, it feels like you're punishing yourself. Everyone's attention, you. because this has been bothering me ever since I joined Kaniku Sensation. His name is Riki, not Ricky. You know, the difference in pronunciation is so little, that's almost pointless to say. That's like, it's not Rin, it's Rin. Can't wait till Cud Wafer is translated. Never <laughs> speak to me again. Coming to a um, state penitentiary near you. Yeah. All right. Let's let's get the move on. Who's next? Cud. All right. Yeah. Next up is indeed Kud. All right. So no more thoughts Cud on Haruka. Not really. I think it's neat how you can choose her at the end of Hitler's route. That's right, but we will get to that when we talk about Hitler. Uh, yeah, we're gonna have a World War II segment after this. Uh, um, at first, in the common route, but toward like when when the route came around, it was my it was it was my last route, and who um, was? Yeah, yeah, it was. I, I followed your order, and um, I sort of hyped myself up a little bit too much for it. Because, like, yes, finally I get to my favorite girl's character. And then I ended up changing my mind to Haruka. I'm, I'm disloyal, <laughs> but... <laughs> you are disloyal. Besides, You're a dog. Besides, besides that, um, I related to her... Um, sort of her struggling as a minority. I did, re I did relate to that to an extent. Um, and what was interesting is that they didn't go for sort of um, straight-up bullying. It was sort of um, unintentional, but you know how people, everyone treats her differently. And when she comes across Ricky, who doesn't treat her differently, she falls in love with him. And that part, that part felt realistic to me. And then the key magic happened. Actually, no. And then the the missile crisis happened, um, which sort of I, I wasn't a big fan of. Um, like all of the, I think you said this on the original podcast. Um, a lot of the characters had little agency, with the exception of the final choice that you make. That wasn't me, uh, that was probably Bread or Magus, because they love that word. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's sort of something that I didn't 100% like. Um, it felt, of all the roots, although there isn't, although towards the end there is finally key magic, but during the whole rocket crisis thing, it felt less grounded and it felt less realistic. Um, even though it doesn't have the most key magic, um, I, I argue that Kurogaya has. Yeah, uh, my whole thing, I guess, with Kud's route and the whole missile crisis thing is that I probably would have liked it a lot better if it wasn't so, I don't know, obvious because, it, like, as soon as they brought that whole thing up, it was like, oh, can't wait for that to immediately become the focal plot point and suddenly cause a problem. And I mean, sure enough, that's exactly what happens. You could see it coming from a mile away. And I guess that's what it, I didn't like. I feel like if it would have been foreshadowed better, perhaps, or if it would have been brought up earlier and built up over the route instead of, hey, there's this missile thing going on. And then like, you know, an hour of gameplay later, oh, hey, now it's a problem, because of course it's a problem, why wouldn't it be a problem? It's very input dumpy when they, they, they brought it up, they brought up Tavoa, etc. Yeah. And it sort of slowed down the roots quite a lot. Yeah. My whole thing with the Kud route was, I really enjoyed the route up until the Missile Crisis, where it was like, yeah, for a good little bit of it, it absolutely destroyed me because, well, I haven't really been exposed to anything like that in a VN before, so it was kind of like, holy shit, what's going on? And Oh, no wonder you've been taking Grisaya so hard. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, just that scene with Kud being chained up and all that, it absolutely destroyed me, and then that key magic happened, and I was like, what the fuck is going on here? I feel and like that, that kinda... was everyone's reaction. <laughs> Yeah, that kind of killed a bit of the emotional impact for me because it was like, oh, now Ricky has like this magical mind power. It was like, oh, your chains are broken. Now get out of here. Where it was yeah, like, I was see, fully convinced she was going to die. It, 
Kud's route doesn't have key magic. It just has nonsense. Yeah, see, it's like... No, it all right, doesn't. I'm, <laughs> I'm following this event, this sequence of events in my mind, and it's like, okay, so what rider thought we would go here? Chika Did they not K. think of any other way to get her out of here? But except for Ricky's mind powers? And it was like, all right, well, I guess this is what we're doing. And the ending was all right. She should but... have just eaten some spinach and just broken out of the chain with her sheer new muscles. Yeah. Ba -da -da -ba -da -ba -da -da -ba -da 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 Wafu. Key ma ma magic is like you know ma magical comas of dream worlds and like you know manifestations of the mind. It's not I use the powers of my mind to destroy your chains. Yeah, but still, like everything up until that point was like very, very good for me. Like I was getting very emotional. I had a really good time. I really enjoyed it. But then that happened, and, and everything just kind of fell off a little bit. All right, I'm, I'm going to take control really quick. So, Maddie, Hello, Maddie. No, Maddie doesn't want to talk about Kood after hey, all. Hey, hi there. There's Maddie. All right, Maddie. I want you to offer your thoughts on Kood's route, and then Kood herself, and then I want you to leave so I can yell at these guys about things that you don't understand yet. Uh... <laughs> 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 um, I just heard what uh, what you guys were talking about uh, about the quote unquote key magic, and I don't know. I liked it personally. Um, I thought I thought it was kind of you know it, it's totally expect you know I was told to expect things from key you know nonsensical stuff in the first place. I was kind of waiting for something to come up that wasn't the whole missile crisis and you know, a, a country in disaster and suddenly these two people who love each other very much are able to communicate through their minds and somehow that leads to Kud being able to break out of her self-sacrifice prison and or her sacrificial -sacri prison or whatever. Say, you I think know, Kud did I that know. to herself? Hold on. <laughs> Nicely worded if wrong. <laughs> Kud committed seppuku. seppuku. Now, um... Seppuku. Sudoku. Anyways. Um... Yeah, I, I like that part personally. Just go, you know, just keeping in line with the topic. Kud's route in general, I really liked. Uh, I played Nishi Zonos first, of course, and Kud's was the last one I played out of the two that I played. Um, and Kud's route just swept me off my feet. I really liked it. She's just a super cute character, and she stole my heart when it comes to Little Buster's heroines, most definitely. You still so have Maddie, quite a few heroines to meet, though. It's it's really <laughs> maybe one day. It's convenient that you've played uh, two Little Busters routes that are uh, sort of polar in terms of the magic they have. Kud is not key magic. Nishizono is very much key magic. So expect. I thought, more I thought of... it would help if I threw in that quote. Um... Yeah, like so. Expect expect more of Nishizono type uh, supernatural stuff going forward with Little Busters. All right, Maddie, I need you to get out of here so I can shut Austin up. Damn it. I wasn't gonna go any further than that. Well, I'm gonna yeah. go further. It's not nonsense, you fool. That's the power of refrain. That's just how oh. it is. It, it's uh. it's the dream world. That is exactly why it is possible. Like because sure, own, when, when yeah, when you're first reading, it doesn't make any damn sense. You're like, well, I'm sorry. How how is this piece of metal, like literally going across space and time, but. When you take refrain into account, the fact that you still consider it nonsense boggles my mind. Because I never took refrain into account. <laughs> 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 uh. <laughs> I literally, I, I literally only just now was like, oh, okay, if you put refrain in there, but yeah, still on its on its own, Kuhn's route is just nonsense. And, but like Nishizono's route is not. I mean, yes, it, it is. is. It is. It is. But not, in the, <laughs> not, not in the same way. Oh, like, you man. can still understand okay, what with, they're going with for, Nishizono's even route. without the secret of the world. Okay, you can still understand that? what they're going for in the me, in the Nishizono route, but not in Nishizono's route. There was never a point where I'm just you know yelling at the screen saying this makes no sense. This is just bullcrap. No, like, how? How could you sit through a literal shadow coming to life and not scream about it? Because I accepted that as key magic. I did not accept Kud's route as key magic. Even though they're the same thing, they're key magic. 
It's an execution. I would love to execute Austin right now. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. I just need about a thousand drinks right now. Anybody else have anything well, to say about Good? <laughs> I was waiting for my turn. Okay. All right, go, go ahead, ahead and corrupt the new guy. All right. Little Buster was one of the first games I played. When I played it, I didn't really have a concept of lolly characters yet. Oh, and here we go. I didn't really understand her as a, I never oh. saw her as a lolly character at any point in time. However, at the very end, when you finally get the CG showing her size difference with the main character, it made me short of breath. So that was a new experience. And then, um, besides that, in general, I found her uh, her speech mannerisms to be particularly endearing, even if I didn't quite understand why. And I just, at the time, was not so good at identifying different characters' speech mannerisms and what they're supposed to implicate. Her Still. English is amazing. I I, I, won't, her, I can't it's lie. It's cute. It's very cute. <laughs> her English is adorable and frustrating at the same time. <laughs> and her, uh, but her, uh, Desu, Nana Desu, Wafu, yeah, ending with Sue, I didn't understand it, but I just knew it was meant to be a cute mannerism. It just communicated it so well somehow. And then it turns out she's the Dairy Dairy. And so, super cute Dairy Dairy, like, I, it's too easy for me to, to pick that as my favorite character right off the bat. So she was my initial love of the game for sure. And that was before and not related to the late Lolly discovery and self-discovery. Um, and as far as the ending of it, um, this is one of my first key games ever. This is my number two key game. I don't know what key game magic is. I don't know what to expect. I did not see her rescue coming. And furthermore, I did not see her capture coming. Holy fucking shit! When they took her into another fucking country and, like, chained her to die, it destroyed me! Why? What the hell? This is the first route I've ever played of Yen where you're supposed to feel the protect her feelings. And so, I mean, that works for me in general, and I'm feeling them pretty strong. And now she's too far away for me to protect, and fucking chained to death, dying, regretting everything. <laughs> Holy hell, that destroyed me! And Welcome she to Key, sick. friend. Oh my god, it was good! And then when she got rescued, I was just too flabbergasted to have a positive or negative opinion about it. Um, I definitely don't feel bad about it, I just don't understand it. He held some sort of scrap metal, and because of that he had psychic powers to break the- I'm sorry, it, it didn't make good or bad sense to me, it just kind of like went over my head. Um, I, I was too I, emotionally I, caught up to let it bother me like it did with Nishizono. I was too into the, everything that happened before. I was too destroyed with the fact that she was gonna die of pneumonia, chained up, the poor little thing, and then when she it's got rescued, I, it, probably a bunch of things at once. She didn't look like she was in good shape, um, but I mean, there's a lot of moisture in that area. But anyway, so she's about to die, and then I'm like, it really, that was an act of mercy to me. It's like I don't have to understand. But thank you for the final scene not being her chained up dying, but her with her tiny stumpy arms reaching out for me for a hug. Yeah, that, that was one of the few moments in Little Busters where I legitimately cried. Because they, they, they drop Little Melody on you, and Ooh, at that point I was intense, done for. It? Yeah. It's, it's intense, man. But um, seriously, though, it, it, it also... Speaking of the first point, I, I try to glare over and not make it inappropriate or anything, but why is she so small? I had never seen a character that small in any game. I think she's like 4'7". It didn't. I didn't understand. She, but she looks fucking miniaturized. She looks smaller than any adult I've ever seen. They, when they show her well, body next to adult. someone, well, the thing is, well, I mean, she's eighteen like everyone else, obviously. Ha ha ha. Oh, anyway, right, so, yeah. so I actually went and posted on Steam forums because this is before I discovered Fua Novel in the community, and I posted, "What is the explanation for why she is so damn small?" And of course, I got the gentle pat in the head. Oh, my dear, she is but a lolly, sweet and summer child. And so my journey began. The end. <laughs> Austin, you got so, something? Yeah, so Corrupted, you said that uh, that this was your first experience with Key. And you I, I played Clan I played Clan Ed first, Little Busters was second, so it's still very much my first experience in a way. So Little Busters was nowhere near my first experience with Key. I knew about other kinds of key magic and in a lot of routes in Key is the whole like idea of like manifestation of uh, I have no idea how to put this into words, like, just having emotions so strong, they manifest into something else. And so that is the reason why I was able to completely accept, uh, to accept Nishizono's route, but not Kud's. Like, yeah, 
Uh, you're right, it is perfectly explained if you take Refrain into account, but uh, I hadn't dealt with a key story that had uh, an overarching plot like Refrain. There, nowhere in my mind was I thinking, huh, maybe this is just a dream world where everything is possible. No, I never thought that. Imagine the and, one and person in life who did, though. And they play Refrain, Refrain and they're just like, man, I have called this from the start. Fuck yeah, that I didn't guy. call that. I, I didn't come close to calling it. I'm happier <laughs> because I didn't. I mean, like, I, I can see why uh, you could take any route as complete nonsense if you're if you're just not well versed in key and understand how their magic works. All right, Proto. Last thoughts on Dear Kud? Um, there's just one thing I'd like to say. Um, I did Kud's uh, roots last, and um, when you compare how Bob, Bob the Kud root was very significant, uh, why the Kud root was very significant for me, is sort of due to the way that I played Little Busters. Um, having the Kud roots as last is very significant. A significant, a significant for for these characters. I'm trying to go as quickly as I can. Um, <laughs> him being able to tell her to to go to Tevoir, um, and when you compare that to the start of uh, what the Kinaku podcast that 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 playthrough doing Rim One, um, him sort of developing over time, going through these routes. Learning, like learning how to let go, especially with the Kurigaya route. Um, I felt that that's quite a significant point for me. Um, and then when you go on to Rin 2, if you do Kud's um, route last, uh, when he's finally able to let go of Rin, um, yeah, that's quite... That's why I think everyone should play Kud Rast, <laughs> Kud, uh, Kud's route last. Wow. So we should play it after the other routes. <sighs> So, Proto, Rennie, I'm please, glad... Please just execute Corrupted instead. You first. So, I'm glad you said that, Proto. Because I have a counter-argument, and that moves us on to the next part. Yuiko Kuragaya. I think Yay! you should play her route last. Because... Yes. Oh. Yeah, because I think, and this is where I think the anime did it perfectly is season one of the little busters anime um obviously because it needs an overarching plot line the rin route plays throughout it but it covers kud nishizono haruka and komari they don't do the kuragaya route until season two which is called little busters refrain and i think that was perfect because kuragaya's whole plot line the whole thing about it snowing in june people losing their memories all that kind of stuff. For me, I didn't do Kurogaya's route last. And I... Yeah, I did not have a good time. Because, like, sure. Kud has the the, the, non, the nonsense with the, the gear. Nishizono has the nonsense with a literal shadow coming to life. But I, those didn't get to me that much. I might not have liked Nishizono's route that much, but it didn't get to me. Kurigaya's got to me. I finished that route, and I'm like, what? Now, what in the what in the? I say, what in the hell was that shit? I was not a happy boy <laughs> because I, I didn't do it with Refrain coming right afterward. I had other routes to do. So by the time Refrain happened, I was like, well, damn it! I really, I really messed that up because. Kurigaya's plot relies the most, I think, on the refrain twist. It was sort of thanks to Magus's speculation when I was listening through the Kanuku podcast along with playing the game that I sort of understood what, everything about what's going on with the Kurigaya route. And it was sort of a confirmation of, oh yeah, Magus's theories are right. And it was just like, oh god, I did not want his theories to be right. Um, and sort <laughs> of the current guy route really confirms that in a hundred different ways. And it is my favorite route because of how... because of how much it emotionally destroyed me, which is kind of part of key. <laughs> but um, in terms of like, that's what key is supposed to do. You're supposed to sort of get enjoyment of... Um, being emotionally destroyed, and that's why we all play key games. Oof, but... that's just why I play visual novels. You cried? You're so not a gay. 
I tried on replaying the game, like starting a new save file and looking at the opening and looking at all the characters and just right? realizing it just fills you with that emotion. And it's such a good OP. Yeah. Alright. Yeah. Our, uh, our boy Crow Tennis has something to say. Hello. Hello. So, when I played through this route, is. It was my third route, I think, because I was doing it in the order of whatever I wanted to do. Oh no. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> Throughout the route, it, like there were all these little things and details that you noticed after the refrain that just made so much sense. Like um, the dreams uh, you had, the, like the intermissions and the dreams it, between each day, all the snow, everything it it works so well after you read refrain but before that you're like what does this mean <laughs> and what's happening exactly so I, I do want to mention that this route emotionally destroyed me on another level <laughs> like it this came close to destroying uh, this came close to making me cry as much as refrain it's just the entire build up throughout the route and you would go finally co like you would go finally yeah, accepting your confession and then everything getting reset each time until finally you realize you realize that she's been forcing this world to stay together to stay together so she can be with you more time it just hurts so much well, that, the implications I mean, behind that, too. Like, the fact that Kyosuke has been the one in control, but Kurugaya's feelings are so powerful that Kyosuke obviously wants to do a reset, and Kurugaya is just not letting him. Yeah, she, she's not letting him. And when it when everything just climaxes and the world, fall, like, finally falls down, it just hurts. And then when... When song for friends start playing after that ending oh, where she after the that ending where she's like I I felt like I loved someone it just ouch I, <laughs> I, I real couldn't ouchy, breathe bro. for a while I, I legitimately couldn't breathe for a while because of how hard I was crying <laughs> and then when you find out like after you play refrain and it has a proper ending when she's with Ricky, it just it just fills your heart. It it makes you feel good to see that she is finally with who she loves. And I I love this route. It, it's my third favorite route in Little Busters after refrain and Saya. somebody else who I will mention. Yeah, Saya. <laughs> Austin, you got something? Yeah, what I like most about Kuragaya's route is how when you first meet Kuragaya, she is she's this uh, stoic, I've got everything under control character. And when you get to her route, you see just how really she she isn't as emotionally strong as she is as she seems to be. They never because are. Uh, uh, because the whole idea behind Refrain is that they all wished strongly to save Ren and Riki and they were they were all you know in agreement that this is the plan this is what they need to do but Kuragaya she can't she can't keep to that she loves Riki too much that she she just can't go with the plan to watch him move on and she instead selfishly takes control of this world so that she can stay with Riki so like what Tennis said with just how how touching her feelings for him are. Uh, that also couples with the fact that it really just shows uh, that she is not as strong as she wants to seem, and that she is very, very prone to breaking down under the pressure of what she knows needs to be done and what she wants to have for herself. Yes, it was a very, a very good portrayal, and Refrain definitely makes it better. Proto, you got something, my lad. Um, another really strong point of the Kurogai Ro is um, its use of the soundtrack and the art. Um, a lot of the CGs and a lot of the backgrounds being used are all very grey and very stoic. And that sort of just develops a massive feeling of touching melancholy. 
I think that's like the best way to, to describe what I was feeling at the time. Melancholy of a quiet girl. Room. Yeah. Melancholy yeah, of a quiet girl. Um, I forgot the track name, but you know, it's one of the piano sound tracks. Oh, just... is it, um, it's either Lamplight or In the Town of Incessant, Incessant one Rain. One of those. Yeah. And um, the use of that when they're walking through the rain together. Um, like of all, of all the roots, even refrain, the use of the color palette and the soundtrack, I feel, is the best, most well done in Kurigaya. Mm -hmm. um, shout out to Takafumi. Um, his, he does a really good blog post about that and its use of the themes of rain and snow and what they represent. Yeah. Let's see. Um, all right, let's go with a uh, new guy, Corrupted. Kurigaya thoughts? Um, Please tell me it's something more than I didn't like her, she has big boobs. I mean... I'm flexible. If I like someone's personality, I can accept big boobs in case certain cases. But uh, what really was a damper on me was that I felt I couldn't buy the romance because it felt like Kurigawa was so many levels far beyond Ricky's league that the entire route, it bothered me the whole time. There's just no way that Kurigawa should be into Ricky. He's just... He is not good enough for her. The actual, like, the world is turning white fading stuff. I actually had a hard time following it, but I really appreciate the aesthetic. It really reminds me of dreamy, like, scenarios like Cross Channel. And I really like that aspect of it. And it would have been a good hint about what's to come, or maybe it's a spoiler and it should be done last, but I did it, like, dead last because Kurogai was the least interesting to me. So by the time I got to it, it was like, okay, yes, okay, this makes sense. Yes, the world is not what it seems. I guessed that from the other, from literally every other route I played added together before I got here. So it did make a very good sense to play last. I feel like if I would have played it first, it would have messed with my experience because it would have been too much of a hint at the supernatural events going on. When you can play other routes like Nishizono and Kud, and it's like, it seems like the supernaturalness is self-contained and not big, a bigger picture within the world. And I feel like those are better ones to play first. Well, but it feels like hers is too attached to the world itself. It's too much of a hint that the world's resetting. Also, somebody said something about her keeping the world going. Man, that went over my head. I wish I caught that. Something about... Can someone explain it to me about how they wanted to, res to let the world go, but she didn't let them? So, um, I mean, the, the whole plot point of Refrain is that Kyosuke and, by extent, the rest of the characters that aren't Ricky and Rin have been keeping this, you know, secret world alive more or less and every single time ricky six su either succeeds or fails they reset to the beginning that's why and this is actually kind of a cool easter egg that's why right at the start of the game even though kyosuke is taking a nap in the school ricky's like why is he all covered in dirt and leaves and shit what where the hell has he been you know, like that, that, that was kind of a cool I thing. I never realized that. Yeah, because he was crawling through the mud and dying. <laughs> but. Wow. Yeah, so. I, yeah, the whole thing is, yeah, he's keeping. He, he is the ringleader. He's the mastermind. He's keeping the secret world afloat with the help of all the others. But when you do the Kuragaya route, and Ricky essentially forms that extra personal connection with the person who is not really into personal connections, she realizes how much she values this. She sort of turns into Kengo. She just wants this to keep going forever, but, and that, that just sort of goes to show Kurigaya's strength in that Kyosuke is the one in control until Riki forms that connection. Then she's like, no, no, I don't want this. And she doesn't have the loyalty to Kyosuke that Kengo does. So Kengo won't take control to keep things going forever. Kurigaya can and will. That makes sense. She is expressed as the most, I guess, physically... I, I don't, what's the word here? I don't know if spiritually is the word. She seems to be the most powerful character aside from Except Kyosuke, so it makes sense. More or less, yeah. Alright, how about your I mean, thoughts, like, Baku? Uh, I honestly don't remember as much about Kurugaya's route as I wish I did, but I do remember that I was uh, accidentally spoiled on a good amount of refrain before I managed to get into Kurugaya's route. But, uh, the whole thing about the world, like, turning gray and all that, like, when I played her route, I already knew a lot of what was going on. And just to see it unfold before my eyes, like, throughout the route, I just kind of had a constant sense of dread in my stomach. Because I knew what was going on, but I just didn't want to see it. 
it was kind of a sense of disbelief kind of thing. Yeah, that uh, that it that's sort of what I felt when I did my reread because I had played Little Buster's the fan translation before English edition. So going through Kuragaya again, knowing what it all meant, I was like, "Oof. This hurts." <laughs> yeah, knowing like all the trouble that Kuragaya and Kyosuke have been going through to try and keep up this facade and Kyosuke wanting to reset things. It's like and all these things like with Kyosuke covered in the dirt and leaves and stuff starting to slip through the mm -hmm. illusion and all that. It's like, holy shit, this is actually real. Like, this is actually going on. Alright, so Proto, you had it. a uh, last thought? Um, it's just uh, about Ricky and um, Kuragaya's um, romance. Um, but the reason why I really liked it, I felt Ricky's uh, feelings for Kuragaya were a lot more genuine than let's say the other uh, routes and that's because um since ricky was a child he's always looked up to people who always assert themselves like kiyosuke um which i very much relate to and um of all the characters in um little, of all the girls in little busters Kurogai is the most like him she really takes charge um of things and her sort of assertiveness and sort of ricky's how much Ricky would wish he was as, as a serve as her. Uh, yeah, that really, I really like that part. <laughs> I really like the how he developed his feelings for Kurigaya. I had two thoughts based on what people just said, if that's okay. Um, one was uh, about mentioning how Kyosuke was covered in leaves or whatever. I had no idea what was going on, and it was very exciting to me to guess, and I was. I couldn't figure out if Kyosuke was God, or if someone else was God, or if it was a combination of people, which turns out to be sort of the truth, sort of all of the above. And when he was covered in leaves and shit, I couldn't help but think, like, he was crawling in the woods to find some occult shrine to make some sort of prayer to reset time to save everybody's life or some shit. I was like, he must be doing something exhausting that resets the world, because he's looking so exhausted. I found that mystery very enjoyable. And the other question was, like, does no one else think that she's out of uh, Ricky's league? Am I the only I one that thought she was too cool for Ricky? That's uh, that's my See, last appeal for me. Well. All right, what's up, Austin? So, so uh, yeah, this I was thinking about this whenever you were talking about how you felt that she was out of his league. Now, I can I can buy that point about not feeling, not buying into the romance, but I don't think it's because she's out of his league. Uh, I'm I don't think like that. Um, but I. I buy it in a way, and then I don't buy it in a way. So on the surface, uh, this is the only, well, I'm maybe the only route. It's one of the only routes, if not the only route, where Riki realizes his feelings for the heroine and like goes after her. It doesn't just happen over time. It's a nice switch. Uh, but so like that's that's nice, and they're. Their love for each other really does feel genuine. I just don't think we get to see enough happen between them to justify uh, such strong feelings they have for each other. But on a not surface level, uh, like I said before, uh, Kurigaya is like, under the surface. She is not emotionally stable. She just puts up this front. She doesn't want to. F well, I mean, she doesn't believe she can be loved. And so she's not used to that kind of feeling. So when Riki goes out of his way to uh, have to have these feelings for her openly, it it really gets to her. I just there doesn't need to be much between them because this is just the first time Kurigaya has truly felt like someone has loved her, and she doesn't want to let go of that feeling. So in in that sense, I really do buy into the romance, whether or not she is out of his league. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> An interesting take. A take that I can respect. Alright, well, we've talked enough about Kuragaya. Now it's time to talk about our favorite blue-haired heroine, Mio Nishizono. So what do we all, all think right, about her? Second best girl. My favorite. <laughs> we, got a, we got a Mio boy here. Mio's uh, nice. He's a good yeah, girl. Yeah, I thought her, I thought her route was... Um, okay 
You know, again, I thought the whole literal shadow coming to life was nonsense. I didn't like it. Uh, but I, I enjoy her. I mean, she... I, I shouldn't say I, I fully do. Because, you know, she... She does, one like, the least amount of changing, I suppose, in the way that she's portrayed. Um, but, you know, she, she wasn't a hassle to put up with. You know, I didn't want to deafen myself like I do with Komari. I didn't want to drink myself into a coma like I originally did with Haruka. She was... I think I enjoyed her more at first simply because she wasn't exhausting to put up with. So, uh, Crotenus, your thoughts? Okay, so about what you said about the shadow taking life or whatever, I think it 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 makes a lot of sense. I'm so sorry, what? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. L hear me out. So we're taking this into account. This is reference. Like this is a dream world where they can manipulate and make whatever they want come true. Uh, it's at least implied that the other busters have some sort of power over it. Uh, apart from just Kyosuke. He gives them enough control over it so that they can help Ricky grow in their own routes. Oh, of course, of course. They, I'm not debating uh, refrain. Like, no, I know, I know, I know. Yeah. But this is, this is what leads into my point. Mio is, from what I think and from what I've seen, a schizophrenic. So, when she is... For her, the shadow is reality. And so when she's giving, when she's in the dream world, she forces her own reality into, into her, into the others. Fucking nut job. And since it's, <laughs> yeah, since it, it's a dream world, everyone else can see it and as reality, or at least whoever she wants to see it, and thus Ricky can see it, and it makes sense in a sort of way that it, it, it happens because it's what she thinks is reality what she thinks it's correct because she is mentally ill and, yeah, yeah. I, I like i like what you said about how it makes sense that other people can uh see her her shadow sister uh because it is a dream world and the world can be manipulated and this is exactly the reason why i don't like uh, Mai's route from canon, because it is the complete opposite of this. It's not a dream world, so the protagonist should not be able to see these manifestations. And that, it, uh, like, mirrors why I like uh, Nishizono's route, because I hate Mai's route, and Nishizono's route is Mai's route done well. Yeah, Nishizono's route for me is first time through, oh, I can't stand it. Second time through, after knowing everything, it ain't so bad. It's pretty good. For me, your enjoyment. Um, Mio's route for me, like, well, like I said when, when we introduced her, like, she's my favorite, and that's mostly because she, her character, just her character type, the quiet book bookworm type, that's just the kind of character that I love the most. And it's like I went into her route expecting something that would go along with her personality. I didn't really expect this kind of really unique idea that, like, at least unique to me, is like. All right, she's got an imaginary friend that she's had since childhood, her an imaginary sister, and gradually she starts like she starts getting like having a bit of a weaker presence going on in the years as time goes by. People less people start to notice her and remember her, and this other presence, Midori, or Midori, whatever, however you pronounce it, is like mighty Midori. Yeah, she's starting to take over and become the more prominent presence of the two. I thought that was a really unique idea, and the whole thing with how the shadow ended up working out is like, holy shit, this is actually really cool. And with the key magic and all that, and that scene with the coffin and all that on the beach, it's like, holy shit, that just destroyed me. For me, it was just too deep for you type stuff. I couldn't really get into it. Now, I don't know if this happened in the visual novel, but there was only one point where I screamed nonsense in this route. When she just turns into a bird for no reason. That more or less happens in the visual novel. Um, it's sort of, it's 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 really metaphorical, and like she sort of turns into the bird, but like not quite. Ricky's just kind of like staring at the horizon, and suddenly Mio is gone, and he maybe sees a bird in the distance. And the bird yeah, is I mean, always I mean, I mean, right on the horizon, right in between the sky and the sea. 
You know, in the anime, she just turns into a bird and flies off. Yeah, that's a little silly. It, yeah, it was, it, it was pretty silly, and that's one of the reasons that I wasn't really a big fan. All right, well, uh, Maddie, you can take your turn. Talk about Nishizono and her route before we get on back to stuff that you know nothing about yet. Nishizono's route was my first route playing um, Little Busters. I think I was originally going to play. Who was I going to play first? I think I was I was centering on either Komari or Kud at first. Kudagaya, actually. Those three. <clears throat> was it Kudagaya? I, yes, I it completely was. forgot. It's been a while. You love the Onesan um, type, so it was Kudagaya. I, I always love the Onesan type, but anyways, um, I got you know I got to that point and um, I got to the point where I was like, man, Nishizono is just an interesting character. You know, she always carries the parasol and. She's kind of cute. She's got that that cure going on, and I, I got to her route, and it was it was going fine. And then you know, she ends up switching bodies with the girl whose name I can't remember. Midori. Can you refresh my memory? Yes, Midori. And um, man, the whole supernatural feel of the route itself was just wonderful. I liked it a lot. Um, I didn't like Midori so much. <laughs> um, she was definitely not my favorite character. She won't be getting any Christmas presents from me. Maddie, if but... I could be real with you, the fact that you really liked both Nishizono and Kud means you're probably going to love the rest of the novel. Wonderful, I'll have to read it. Because those are the big um, polarizing ones. If you can love both of those, you're in good shape. Unfortunately, I don't think I really have anything special to say other than I really like them both. I didn't find too much negative about either route. I did think that Nishizono, uh, I didn't like Midori so much and I didn't understand why, you know, I was really, of course, you're not meant to understand what's really going on until it's explained to you. You draw your own conclusions, but I found Nishizono's unexplained, um, bullshit bullshit just annoying <laughs> at first why is Midori here why do I, I have to get have done it like why that do I have... bullshit <laughs> but for like the first 15-20 minutes of experiencing Midori instead of Nishizono and I was just like why do I have to put up with this like just tell me what's going on already it was just pointless it was very pointless to watch her try and sway Riki over to the other side because I knew he wasn't going to I could kind of just feel that he was going to always remember Nishizono um, and I felt like that whole that whole build up to oh he finds her essay on the wall and he'll always remember her now kind of pointless I wasn't a big fan either yeah uh, but I, I really did enjoy Nishizono as a, as a character I thought Riki I thought Riki was pretty good decent um, and yeah I, I didn't like Midori she, she... <laughs> well thank you for your thoughts now go on Get out of here. That's probably where she is now. <laughs> All right. Well, let's see. Proto, you had a passing thought. Um, well, just it's mainly how it's your enjoyment uh, depends on how much you can relate to um relate to. Your enjoyment depends on how much you can relate to Nishizono. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like, would kind of agree. Yeah, um, how she sort of wants to be, well, sort of how she pushes her insecurities, oh yeah, I wish I was sort of this outgoing type of person. At least that was my interpretation. On to Midori, I really related to that. Okay. Baku, but like, not thoughts? the, I want to be an isolated bird flying in the sky. Yeah, one last thing I wanted to touch on uh, before we moved on. Uh, was a lot of the writing with Midori was like the entire scene where she's gaslighting Ricky and like the scene th making him think that uh, Mio had glasses the whole time and you play back the CGs and like they make it hat so she has glasses I thought that was brilliant like that fuck with me yeah that really left an impression is like oh even Ricky's starting to forget this is really starting to get a little real and I really just enjoyed Midori as a whole. I think you were meant to dislike her a little bit with the way she was just like trying to take over Mio's life. But once it sort of plays out and you sort of understand her reasoning behind that, 
that she really wanted to be able to be her own person and all that. It's like, well, I don't hate her as much anymore. I can kind of see her and like her as a character. Ah, yeah, okay. Let's see. Oh, Corrupted, you haven't shared your Nishizono thoughts yet. She was the first route I did. Uh, she is easily the most physically attractive and striking. She's the Kudere, so I just like want to get all up in that. And Kudere? No, Kudere. Learn to pronounce Japanese. So she's she's super Ooh. hot. She has perfect body type. She's wonderful. And since she's Kudere, you're like part of me is like once you leave her alone, she's happy doing her own thing. But since the game didn't go to some sort of awkward sex scene, I think I never really fully developed those thoughts. Those games that take you to like man, they really had sex quickly and she just really wasn't that into him, kind of bothered me, but no. They, they, the climax was they held hands. Perfect. But anyway, it was, the fact, it was adorable. Despite the fact that uh, she was, she's pretty much hot as shit, I thought that she had the least to do with the, with the wider story. It felt like I was playing a different game. It's like, why? My thoughts were like, there's this big mystery of the world that's being hinted, and you're slowly getting pieces, and you're coming up with guesses, and it's very fascinating. Yet, her magical story is completely unrelated. It's like, okay, so she has a imaginary friend that's taking over her life or whatever, but like, it has nothing, it feels like, if, I mean, now in retrospect, I didn't realize until this podcast, I think, that Cud's magical bullshit was due to the fact that they're in a dream world. Okay, I just thought it was magical bullshit, like, on its own. And yeah, same thing- I was the only one who felt that way. Same thing with, uh, with uh, Nishizono. I thought it was, I thought she had a magical, uh, you know, friend forever. I didn't interpret it that she was uh, schizophrenic and that the magical magic of the dying people dream world allowed it to come into existence, but now that I hear the explanation, it makes perfect sense and it's easy to accept. But at the time, and, and up until like this moment, my interpretation was like, she has her own separate magical journey, she has her own freaking VN, and now let's go back to the rest of the VN where I'm trying to figure out what the greater mystery of the world is. So it's like I played a separate game that didn't have anything to do with anybody, and really, I get the same impression from all the girls that are that happen to die conveniently and join the dream world and aren't part of the uh, actual group. It's like they're kind of tacked on. It's like you have a great adventure with them and they're here just because they conveniently died. But they're not really as much part of the greater meaning. Well, I'm glad this podcast wasn't wasted then. You See, learned something. Like, T.I.L. That, uh, that was something I found interesting about Mio's route is how, uh, like... She her route has one of the biggest route long mysteries aside from Kurugaya's route, but it's really its own mystery that has nothing to do with the other mystery that spans the entire game. Uh, that's just an interesting thing there, how it was the biggest mystery route while also being the most unrelated route. I thought that that bad ending was okay. I mean, it's no nowhere nearly as near as good as um as a uh, sweets girl's bad ending, but um. It, 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 if anything, it irritated me a little bit because the bad ending felt like it was punishing you. It's like, oh, you picked me. Okay, ah, ha, ha, well, the world's gonna end now. Sorry. It's like she, Midori was kind of saying that, well, I'm a dream, so I can't last forever. You really should have picked the, the living girl. All right, let's move on before Rini has a stroke. <laughs> We're crunched for time. So I guess now we focus on the main feature, the main story of Little Busters, Natsume Rin. My personal favorite. However, one of my least favorite routes. It makes me so uncomfortable. That feeling of everything falling apart just fucks me up. God, what did I you guys it. think? It was so great. Man, I don't know. I, I kind of, I wouldn't say I enjoy, but uh, I do like the kinds of stories that really just make you feel like everything is becoming hopeless. Uh, right when you think that you can somehow turn this around, it just gets worse. And it, it doesn't get better. It just keeps going down and down and down and, and then it ends. Right? Man, the, the ending sort of messes you up too because the, the ending credit song, Regret, there's no vocals or anything. It just literally sounds like, oh Jesus, what have I done? Right. Something really bad just happened. Yeah. It was not it was not supernatural enough. It was way too mundane and traumatizing. It hit way too close to home, the whole being a stupid teenager running away from home getting legal trouble bullshit. Yeah, man, it was it was rough. But uh 
I, I also I do have to respect it though because when I first completed it like as uncomfortable as it made me I was like fuck I can't just not start refrain even though I have school in the morning I gotta at least start refrain because it does such a good job of making you like as soon as they show Kyosuke holding the cat you're like oh fuck and nothing happened in this world starts playing. What what an evil, uncomfortable song, by the way. The first time it plays is then as well. Oh, actually, no. It plays once before. What? Yes, it plays for one moment. And after um after the scene in the common route where um Kengo's girl, the archery girl, um is on the roof and Kengo saves her. The very first time, and I think it's only that time, the very first time that happens, there's a scene with Ricky who remembers Kyosuke saying, Kengo will understand soon enough, and nothing happened in this world starts to play, and Ricky's like, that's weird, did he plan this? That's when Ricky first starts to get suspicious, and I think because he controls the world, I think Kyosuke catches on to that, so when he resets after the route is done, Ricky doesn't say it again. I don't remember him saying that ever again. I think it only happens once. I could be wrong. But I, I think forgot it that it happens. Once. So that that might be true. God, Ricky's thick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just he, he, as a key protagonist, he's one of my least favorite. Like even though Yukito, Yuichi, and Tomoya are kind of all the same, they were a lot more fun than Ricky. Um, so, what are our thoughts on Rin, I, I, I guess? I, oh, for, she's great. She is great. She like, initially I, started I, off as, like, not one of my favorite characters, but as I got further in her route, it was like, okay, she's starting to grow on me. Oh, and she don't worry, guys, if, if, if any of you don't like Rin, I'm not going to put you on a list, don't worry. I don't believe you. Man, <laughs> I, I love it. I mean, like, my... My adoration for Rin is nowhere near as great as yours, Lord Ronnie. But <laughs> I I did like her a lot. She's one of my favorite key characters. Um, but she also did have to grow on me. I don't think I uh, had fully loved her as a character until uh, until her route, whenever uh, Riki and her start getting closer. I, I like the dynamic they had with each other. Um, I think one of my favorite scenes is when Riki just says, uh, So, um, wanna be my girlfriend? She just goes, Yup! No, that is not that how is it happens. Yeah, it's the other way around. Rin's like, Hey, Ricky! And Ricky's like, Uh, mm yeah? -hmm. She's like, Let's date. That completely threw me off guard. Like, right? And it's such like, a cute CG, fuck? too. But it made sense. It made sense. I like Rin, but I'd say of a lot of the characters, she's the less least um, in depth. Never mind. You're on the list. <laughs> I, oh no! It's it's like the song "You Had Me at Hello." For Rin, it was like "You Had Me at Hey Hitler." You know, <laughs> I was she, she had me from Hey Hitler, so it was pretty good. For me, she was a cautionary tale of why you shouldn't date teenagers. It's like you kept wanting her to quit being so dumb, so thick, and so unemotional, but you could never really connect with her because she really was kind of retarded. And so when you actually run away and try to make things work out, you can't rely on her to get by and survive because she's just a stupid kid. Yeah. Yeah, it's... it. Hers is also... It, it's, it's a weird combination of key magic and realism, whereas all of the other routes, they, they tend to be either or. So that probably contributed to the actual whole feeling of discomfort for me, honestly. But yeah, they, they, they do a very realistic job of portraying Rin as the type of character she's supposed to be. You know, which sounds redundant, but like all of the others, you don't really think of them as high school you know characters you think they, they're like all of the other typical anime characters where they're 17 but they talk and act like they're a well-seasoned adult type thing no rin actually is a stupid anti-social teenager by all means it's a very realistic portrayal i agree so any last thoughts on our goddess i never forgave her for biting my hand 
Still don't understand she, she why she grows cat ears sometimes. She didn't deserve what happened to her. <laughs> All right. Well, then I guess this is where we get on to uh, we get on to the biggin refrain. So I said this during the last refrain podcast, but this is where I make up for my past mistakes because in the refrain podcast, my microphone wasn't working. So the main thing I was bummed out about, you know, aside from the literal minutes straight of awkward silence was that I didn't get to be on the record and say that Refrain has got to be the most powerful true arc in any key game, in my opinion, because... In any visual novel. Yeah, my favorite story to tell when I go... when I talk about this is I, uh... I remember having school the next day, as I was talking about when I was going through the Rin route, and I started to refrain, and I'm like, all right, I've got about an hour before I, I have to go to bed, so I can, I can get a little bit of refrain started out. And it could have stayed that way, except right around the time I started to go to bed, Masato said the words, I guess you've come far enough. And the main menu theme kicks in for the very first time in the game. And I was like, ah, oh, fuck, no school tomorrow. And I stayed up the whole night finishing Refrain, and I have never done that before with literally anything up until that point. Yeah, I I love Refrain so much. No, actually, recently, I think last month, uh, I rewatched the Refrain anime with a friend of mine who was watching it for the first time. And during uh, the the latter part of it, we just sobbed for an hour straight watching it. <laughs> it's pretty powerful. It's very hard Jude, Jude Maeda's, it's one of his best works. Like, I, I praise that man for Clan Ad day in and day out, but Refrain is so well written. Uh, I'd say After Story is still, I prefer. I still prefer After Story, but Refrain. Oh, me too. Refrain did a lot of things uh, well, um, in terms of just everything. <laughs> Can't say anything specific, just everything. Yeah. Nope. Uh, for a while after I first watched Refrain, there were certain quotes that could just trigger a spout of crying just by thinking them. Do me a favor and remind me, what's the difference between Rin, the second Rin la- route, and Refrain? So, the second Rin route is where um, it, it doesn't cut off, and they end up running away because Rin's forced to go to the other school, and the police break in, and it becomes a traumatic event. And that's where it ends, Ricky sitting alone in school. Refrain starts out like any other Little Busters route, except something's obviously very different. Kyosuke is all kinds of fucked up. He's locking himself in the room, and Ricky essentially has to take over for him and rebuild the Little Busters. Also, none of the other heroines are anywhere to be found. And Ren is completely traumatized. Yeah, Ren is like like a child, almost. Ah, uh, so Refrain's, Refrain's when Ricky corners everyone and like forces them to get back together and figure things out. Yes. Okay, so which... What is the correct interpretation? Is is Rin retarded because she was molested when she was little, or she's super afraid of men because the police held her down in the in Rin two? I couldn't quite tell. I don't think it's either. I, I think just... she just lost her her trust of everyone apart from Ricky. Well, they made lines about her being really afraid of big men holding her down, and I was like, well, that just happened in Rin two. But now that I think about it, I think that's supposed to be a re-traumatization. I think she's messed up from something happened when she's little, and they just did a good job never going into details on it. Oh, anyway, yeah, no, it's definitely from when she was little. Um, but, I, yeah, I don't think it was anything like that. I just think, I don't know, maybe she was bullied or something like that. I don't think it was anything serious, because if I'd like, I like to think, if I know anything about Jun Maeda, it's that if they intended it to be anything serious, they would have done a lot more than just, oh, yeah, something happened. So I just think it was just an irrelevant thing. And I suppose different imaginations fill in blanks differently. And yeah. The fact that it's, it's left to have the blank filled in is why it's good. Yeah, I think it just existed simply to make you understand why she acted the way she acted at the end of Rin 2. Why, despite her trust in Ricky, that she 
bit his hand and ran away, and then she's extra traumatized at the start of refrain. She's afraid of tall men for some reason. That being said, that CG of her with the kids is so heartwarming. Like in in such a in such a heartbreaking way. Ricky just like saying it, it, it he's, when he almost starts crying. Look at it, looking at it, just pretty hit me hard. For me, it was like, this is where she's meant to be. Quit trying to date her, it's too awkward, she's too immature. She really just needs to be in a special home. He's not trying to date her at this point. I'm combining my feelings from before, when previous in the route, where I'm like, man, this feels forced. Oh, yeah, I suppose, but it was meant to feel that way. Because Rin is clueless about love, they're very clear about that. And Ricky, obviously, is clueless to, an, to a point. So that, that's the whole thing. Like, Rin is the main girl, but she doesn't have, like, a romance story. That's why you can't get her romance ending until after you finish Refrain and you redo it. So one of my favorite parts of Refrain is the writing of Kiyosuke early on in Refrain. Now, I've seen a lot of people point out that, like, if, if everyone is supposed to forget about what happened in the previous route when Kiyosuke does his resets, why is it that uh, Rin is still traumatized at the beginning of Refrain? And a lot of people didn't pick up that this is the point where Kiyosuke, his power is fading, and he can't, he can't take hold of the world anymore, and that's why he was so forceful in Rin 2. Why he decided to just push things along and uh, take matters to the extreme, and he went too far. See, I disagree. Her. Hmm? I don't think his power was fading. I think it was more... I Because that that's why he's portrayed as so evil, quote-unquote, during the CG where he's holding Lenin. I don't think his power was fading. I think now he was like, no, I know best. So we're going to do this whether you want to or not. And that's why yeah, I, I think he's so traumatized in Refrain, because he thought he knew best, and he was like, Jesus Christ, I could not have been more wrong. Well, here's how I interpreted it. Um, so, first off, that's just how I explain why Rin is still traumatized, because Kyosuke no longer had the power to fully reset everything. Like, he could make them forget exactly what happened, but he could not erase their emotions and the effect that it had on them anymore. And another reason why he is so traumatized at the beginning of Refrain is because he went too far, nearly broke Rin, and now he can't fix it. See, no, that's another spot where I disagree. Because, okay. yeah, it's it's not that... Kyosuke can't wipe things completely. Do you know why? Because Rin changes throughout the game. So and, and Ricky, that's kind of the whole point of the scenario. Yeah. But so why doesn't Ricky remember his romance with uh, other heroines? Oh, he still picked up like the lessons that he learned from it subconsciously or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he can only he can only wipe it to an extent. And I think again, I don't think it's that his power was fading. I just think the whole thing that happened with Rin fucked him up so badly that he just lost the will. Because at that point, you notice. Um, Kengo and Masato are much more prominent. At that point, I think it's them keeping the world alive. I felt it's just that uh, Rinny. Uh, sorry, Rinny. <laughs> <laughs> I felt that Rin was so traumatized that he that he couldn't simply completely reset her trauma. Like his power is limited in the world. Oh, I don't think yeah. The other, the other characters besides Ricky and Ren get reset. I think you kind of get clued into that in Hitler's route. Okay, can we can we call her Kanata, please? I can't remember <laughs> her name, so she's Hitler. <laughs> Wait, you've been you you've been referring to Kanata route this whole time? Yeah, I'm not. Anytime he's I, been I, saying I, I, no, it's not the cat. He's been calling Kanata yes, Hitler. I thought this was some secret cat route. <laughs> <laughs> no, not quite. I have my own problems with cat route, but I guess we'll get to it. So doors route. So I, I I didn't bring it up when we were on the Rin the Rin discussion, but I wanted to bring it up now since we were going to come around to it anyway. But um, cheap tricks is still one of the best scenes in a visual novel I've ever ever seen. Despite how much we meme it. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, 
yeah no it, it is written so well because you know that's that's where the pe- that's where the discomfort hits the peak like that's why i dislike the part where ricky and Rin are living on their own so much because that baseball game in the rain and kosuke's complete revelation that no maybe he's not the hero we've been thinking he is you know that just led me to feel uncomfortable for the rest of the rin route and then probably my favorite parts of refrain even though obviously it's it's most of refrain are the episodes because they are they're perfect episode masato fantastic episode kengo where they actually show cheap tricks from his point of view perfect i i love those so much yeah that scene when kiyosuke flashes uh that that girl who nobody can remember the name of uh when he flashes that image of Tango's girl during the game that is just destructive i was just like oh my god kiyosuke you actual bastard like that is a that is a low blow I mean, like, I really, at that moment, I really felt for Kengo and could feel every emotion he was feeling. I just, I, I feel like that's how everyone felt. When well, and hearing, that hearing that. how he talks, how he thinks about Kyosuke during that scene, like how he's just like, no, you do not do this. Like hearing how he talks about Kyosuke and then combining that with the fact that this dude has idolized Kyosuke the entire time we've known him. You know, it's such it's such a realistically portrayed betrayal, you know, despite yeah. the fact that it's a very key magic moment. I had a hard time understanding some of his thoughts, although it made more sense in context later on. But, like, I, I was wondering at the time, like, is that Archer girl real? And it took me a minute to realize why he was saying, oh, it's, it's such a personal intrusion. Because I, when I finally realized that most of the characters aren't real, that really, that Archer Girl was Kendo's masturbatory tool. So it really was too personal to be bringing that up. It's not a masturbatory tool. <laughs> what are you talking about? He created himself an imaginary girlfriend with no brain, just to have company. No, he didn't. That was somebody very close to him in real life that threw herself off the roof and died. Right, but she didn't die on the bus trip, so she's not real, like every other character except the main cast. I suppose that totally wasn't the point though I mean Kendo created her she wasn't there and then he created her for company and then someone else messed with it it's not even company he created her because she was dead and this was his one chance to interact with her again he is dead she is alive and elsewhere he created her from memory in order to to get company she is dead she is dead as dead can be she wasn't on the bus trip guys she's alive no she threw herself on the off the roof before the bus trip was that supposed to be before the bus trip? Because I remember oh, it yeah. happening during the game route itself, so that made me think it happened during after they're already dead. No, the whole thing with that, it, it, it obviously happens beforehand. She's, she's dead, and that's why this is such a personal thing for him, because when... Because Kengo doesn't join the team during your first run-through of the common route. She doesn't throw herself off the roof during your first run of the common route. That just never happens. And Kyosuke, during that first common route, is just like, don't worry, Kengo will understand soon enough. Well, Kengo never does. So that's why when it happens the second time onward, and if you, I don't know if you ever chose it, but if you try and press Kengo on, if you try and like bug him about why he's not running up to save her, that's why he's so pissed off about it. Because he knows this is Kyosuke making him relive this thing that he had to endure because he knows this time Kengo's going to save her. He's going to do what he couldn't do in real life. Okay, it's starting to make sense now. I think it's a good correction. I'm re-remembering that the actual game loop itself is the month before the accident, not an imaginary time afterward. So things that happen during the game loop might have happened in real life. And that's an interesting interpretation, and I'm buying it now, that Archer Girl yeah. died in real life, but Ken- Kendo's bringing her back for kind of like company and to kind of like make believe that he saved her. I don't think it's make believe. I don't think it's coping. I just think it's his one Achilles heel. It's his one weakness. This is because yeah. the whole theme of Little Busters is regret, and Kengo's regret is he couldn't save her. I kind of saw it as like everybody gets to get laid or have a little bit of fun before they die. Let's help the two no. characters that could live no, actually it's got have something nothing with done with their to life. Do with that. That aside, 
It, the thing is that Kengo did not make her. It was Kiyosuke that brought her into this world, and Kengo couldn't stop himself from saving her. My interpretation is that just Kengo created her unintentionally. She just appeared before him, and he was like, oh god, because it's such a massive, massive thing um, in his mind, a massive regret. Well, you have that one background scene where, um, which doesn't come into existence until she starts appearing and then becomes important later. You know what I'm talking about, where Kendo's like sitting on a bench with her, and then from that point on, it becomes a plot location. Uh, my interpretation was he created that area, he created that girl, and it was company for him. He's a man that doesn't connect with females very often, but now he has someone he can kind of have a mentorship role. He may or may not have had that with her in real life, but now in the Infinite Dream World, it's an addition he chose to make in order to get some fulfillment. And then Kyosuke turned it into something ugly. I think it's probably a mix of both. Because I, I think just with the way Kengo is, I think if it was purely Kyosuke's creation, then you're right. That scene where Riki and Masato catch him talking to her would not have happened. Because the way Kengo is, Kengo would have been like, no, no, I am not going to indulge in this. Especially after the whole being forced to save her thing. I think Kengo would completely just not go along with it. So I think so, I think Kengo made her, and then Kyosuke made her reenact her suicide. That's what I was gonna say. Yeah, yeah, it works for me. It's hard. It's it's kind of tricky to to, to imagine and understand that every one of the god characters, every character except for Ricky and Rin, contributes in some way to the creation of the world, even if Kyosuke is a primary contributor. Yeah. And there's think, so many uh, characters that aren't real, it's just fucks with me. I think Kiyosuke, Kengo, and Masato are really the main contributors, like the actual ones keeping the world together and controlling it in a way, but it was all the other characters' wishes that helped it come into creation. Yeah, that was my interpretation too. Kiyosuke is the pivotal point because he created the world. He had the mental cry that started it, and they kind of responded. And it does feel like the men are the, are the gatekeepers of the world, while the women contribute a little bit less. I, I wouldn't look at it like that, but I mean, I I can't deny that's how it is. I wouldn't make that. Well, I'm not making. I'm not that, saying so. it's. A, I'm not saying I it's. A, that speak, though. I wouldn't say it's about their gender. It's not magicoy. I'm just saying that coincidentally, the men had a friend group that included one girl, and it just who so was happened mostly that, a boy. <laughs> who was who was mostly like a prepubescent mentally, and so there because the girl just happened to be one of the characters who they kept innocent so that she could escape. There was no girl in primary control. Now here's something I never understood. Did they make the decision that Rin and Riki would be the ones who lived, or were they just the ones who survived? They made but the they decision. They formed the world with that in mind, because they all well, like, cared about their poor, underdeveloped friends a I don't think you understood his question entirely, right? He was, he's asking, yeah. did they make the decision that they get to survive? No, they, are, they know. already know they get to survive. Right, like, did they, like, was it, was it how it happened? Like, they knew that Rin and Riki were going to survive, but they- They definitely knew. They, they made yeah. that pretty clear, I think. Because, you know, um, because Kengo and Masato, um, protected Rin and Riki. In the bus um, bag. from the massive, like, from the- f But of the a lot of the time, it kind of seems like, uh, they, uh, they, they all, like, they all came together and they're like, okay, so who do we want to save? Hmm, how about Riki and Rin? Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> they just, well, they, they form the secret world and they just have a fucking coin flipping contest. I, like, I think oh, damn it, Kyosuke, I have to die. Kyosuke has a special power to be able to perform a little bit of painful reconnaissance in the real world. So if anything, I think it, it might be fair to to guess that even if they didn't already know that Rin and Ricky were going to survive, Kyosuke can figure it out. He can keep crawling over bleeding to death and then say, hmm, these two people look like they can live, but the rest are toast. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose. Alright, so I guess the, cr the last thing I want to discuss regarding Refrain is, and I mean, maybe it doesn't even need to be a discussion. Um, so, y'all are aware that Ricky and Rin saving everybody is not time travel, right? It's definitely time travel. No, it was not time travel. Wait, what? 
Okay. I so, didn't 100% understand the ending of Refrain. All right, well, then I got I you, my I man. I didn't need to. Because this I, is I, the I, other I felt part. At the time, I didn't need to, but the, I think This I'm is the there. other part of the Refrain podcast that I was bummed got cut out because my mic wasn't working. All right, so I'm going to lay it out for you. Here's how I understand it, and I am like 99.9% .9 sure it's right. So after you get through all the character episodes and... and they have their whole moments and all that. They have their big goodbye at the baseball field. Very good scene, by the way. Um, Made so, me cry a lot, and I had to run to get tissues lots, from lots yeah. of crying. crying. Yeah. I was holding on well, and then Kyosuke had to cry too. Fuck, man. Boys don't cry. So what ends up happening is that when when Ricky and Rin escape, and they wake up, and they run away, that is not real. That is Kyosuke's final test. That is why, when they're in the hospital afterwards, Kyosuke is still able to say, that's enough, right? Because he wanted Ricky to say, yes, that's enough. And then once that happened, Kyosuke would know they accomplished their mission, so then he would end the world, they would wake up in reality, and escape. That is why the choice you have to make is it's not enough. Because that's when Rin and Ricky are like, no, it's not enough. Now it's our turn. Everybody else has gotten over their regrets. Now it's our turn. Ricky gets over the regrets involving his parents' death, his narcolepsy. Rin gets over her regrets of not being friendly with everybody, about taking them for granted. So they get over their weaknesses, and that's what lets them take advantage of Kyosuke's weakness and run the dream world. So that's what lets them take control. That's how Ricky does his weird, trippy, inside himself and his memories type sequence. That's how Rin is able to go from place to place and have her memories and all that. That's how that final discussion with Komari happens. Because they're in control now. I so, might end up accepting the explanation because it does such a good job dragging all of the supernatural stuff after they wake up into the same explanation as the rest of the supernatural stuff. Yes. Yeah, exactly. and and so yeah so once all this happens you know that that's why because that that's what didn't make sense at first to me you know if they woke up and if they ran away how the hell are they doing this well no it's because they didn't wake up that was Kyosuke's final test so once they overcome their weaknesses once Ricky is, knows that okay now I'm not gonna pass out like a dipshit <laughs> that is when now that Kyosuke is not in control anymore that is when Ricky and Rin say all right we're good that is when they wake up in reality and save everybody I don't think that's a bad interpretation at all I feel like I'm still really stuck to my first interpretation though that's because you're a stubborn boy but no, it, yeah, it's not time travel, then that, that is the best explanation that I can come up with that obeys all the rules. Sure, it's still key magic-y because you can't really explain how in the hell the secret world became a thing, but whatever. It's a key novel, it's a visual novel. You gotta, you, you gotta stop looking for answers for everything to some extent, as much as it sucks, as annoying as it is. But well, it's yes. not super fair to come up with, with what you say is the end-all explanation and say stop looking for answers. Oh, no, I'm not saying stop looking for answers after that. I'm just saying, because that's the answer I've come up with. That is that is my golden truth. I like your explanation, <sighs> and I think it's better than mine. Although I do think <laughs> there is some inherent time travel that happens. No. Uh, every time that Kyosuke takes a nap, he wakes up, crawls over in his last final moments, dies, which resets off the beginning of the world again. So it's kind of like there's this loop, and that's why they're able to have their world in infinity, because their their dream world actually takes place outside of time. See, I, I don't take that as time travel. I simply take that as it's dark out, he's bleeding out, he's completely fading from consciousness. So I take that as when he says the line, I keep getting reset, I take that as, no, you just did not get near as far as you thought you did. I, I think everybody is continually experiencing their last moments. That's why at the beginning of Reframe, you actually start getting that, that flash of the bus, which, it, which shows that Ricky and everyone else are probably also experiencing similar, something similar to Kyosuke. He's just more powerful. Uh, it feels like they, they live, they do their route, and then at the end of the route, 
they they are back to they've reround a little bit a few seconds a few minutes before they've died then they die then the route begins again and it's almost like the, the time going forward inside the game inside the dream world is a little bit of time going backwards outside so it kind of feels like a loop like that was just how i saw it in my head i'm not saying your explanation's not better but that's what that's explained kiosuke crawling on the ground and dying every time it seemed like he was retrying the same thing not that he was getting a little bit farther but i think it could be either way yeah that is kind of the fun about key novels is that usually there's not always a definitive answer there's a few answers that work well that does it for the main Little Buster story. We got three ah! more discussions to go for, though. So, uh, let's oh. talk about, uh... Well, there was one last thing, well, a couple last things I wanted to say about Refrain. If that's alright with you. Sure. So, um, in my last rewatch of the Refrain anime that I said I watched with my friend, uh, he had a very, very interesting... A reaction to it so it's during those scenes where Rin is doing her goodbyes fantastic scenes by the way and I'm like I remember these scenes I'm gonna go and uh, make our lunch so I go in I go in the kitchen set some water bile I come back in and he's just crying like a newborn baby I'm like dude what happened he turns to me and he says Doka and Stroka won't know why Kuhn never came home <laughs> and then I just sat down and cried. harsh <laughs> that is nice pretty photo, rough. Yes. Uh, but yeah, af when, after I first watched Refrain, like I said, there were a couple quotes that could just get me crying if I even thought them. Uh, one of those was one that Kiyosuke says, where uh, he finally turns around and he started crying and he says, It's not fair. Why do I have to leave you behind when I'm the one who loves you more than anyone? And even, even now, <laughs> I can't even now, I can't say that without without getting a, a catch in my throat. So you, you say that, and I instantly hear the crescendo of Haruka Kanata far away. <laughs> da, 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 da. Yeah, it's oh, rough. Another one that this didn't kill me until my until my second go through, but it's during Kengo's final scene, where he catches the ball, and he looks up at them and he says, "Was my life a happy one?" God, I Ouch. Felt, felt for Kengo so much. <laughs> no, he held back when he could have lived. So much, so much in Refrain that's just one line can hit you like a truck. It was good shit. Alright, we ready to move on to Hitler now? Off him. <laughs> Alright, well this is Come where... Uh, yeah, it was very forced. <laughs> This is where we get on to the extra routes that were added a year after Little Busters first came out. And the first one we'll discuss is everyone's favorite student council lady, Kanata Futaki. Surprise my shotgun. <laughs> it, honestly, I thought they did a really good job of making her like like likable. Like after you'd finished Haruka's route, you understood why she did what she did but you're still mad because she's still an idiot. But they didn't make it feel too forced. Like, when they introduced her into the route and Ricky starts hanging out with her, it didn't feel jarring. I was like, oh, no, this this yeah. sequence of events makes sense. They really use the perspective switch um, and using um, Kanata's narrative perspective to really make you empathize with her. I'm uh, running a. Go ahead. I don't remember anything about this route, at all. Honestly, it was pretty boring. All right. I, I, the, the only thing I remember about this route is, uh, what Haruka's fantastic alternate clothing that is only shown at the end of this route in the anime. That's pretty great. Oh, it's I in the anime. I was thinking a normal standard clothing is pretty great too. Right. Cause. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah, that's what it is. I didn't know for a very long time that these were just her casual clothes that she wears. She wears them at the end of the Haruka to... ending as well. It feels very appropriate for the problem child to me. You know, I, I like it. I really like that outfit, and that is literally the only thing I remember about this route. I'm running out of juice. Here's my last comments. The uh, I really liked Hitler's route because it gave you the perspective of everyone else who's living within the infinite dream. 
after you've already played the original game, you know it's a dream, so now we get to see what it's like to live in the infinite dream and not be unaware like Ricky and Rin. And two last yeah. comments. Cat Girl didn't have enough romance for me, and Saya's best bittersweet love the ending. The end. I gotta go. <laughs> Alright, thanks for joining. And then there were two. So, um, well, actually, yeah, I mean, Proto, this is going to be your last one. So do you have any final thoughts on Kanata and or her route? Um, well, I don't absolutely hate her. I want to kill her anymore, which <laughs> I suppose was sort of the, um, the most of the route. It does add an extra sort of Harakus was, as I said back when we were discussing Haruka, Harakus felt a little bit incomplete. I mean, it completed her character arc, but it didn't complete the overall storyline. Of course, in the context of um, The Secret of the World, that's not really important. But now um, now the, that we know everyone survives, then we do the re Wedding Crasher ceremony. Um, you know, yeah. one of my favorite things about that is that because Kanata's ending takes place in reality, and you have the option to not romance Kanata, and if you don't... You can, like, when you're hiding in the closet with Haruka, you can give her a smooch. And that tells me that even though Rin is the canon girl, Haruka has a chance in reality. And that's, that's, I love it. <laughs> yeah. It's all about your interpretation of how much, how you, um, they, they intentionally left it open-ended, um, as to, um, who it, Ricky and ends up with uh, the fact that you have to complete refrain refrain twice um kind of shows that yeah. like Maeda intended for Ren to be the canon girl but he in comparison to Clanad it's not um, a, yeah it's it's not like Clanad it's not a story of romance so if she's not the final romantic goal that's okay that doesn't go against anything yeah exactly all right well so I guess that's when you depart, and uh, Austin and I, we are left alone to discuss the last two routes. Matt, we'll grab tennis. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah, glad you could join us. Get some sleep over there across the pond, mate. I definitely do need it. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. All right, well, I guess this is where we talk about everyone's favorite angry cat girl, Salami. I really liked this route. I liked it a lot, actually. Um, and that came as a surprise to me because I didn't really like Sasami's character. Um, she, I mean, I, and I suppose she's kind of supposed to be portrayed that way. She's, she's the token villain, the token rival. And they didn't really give her that much in the common route and all of the other characters' routes. Um... Despite the fact that she was present in the original story, her route feels more tacked on than Saya's route does, <laughs> to me anyway. Um, just because, you know, they don't change anything with the common route, you know. So once you're onto her route, it takes place in reality. I mean, at first, but it takes place all the way in October. Like, you jump, like, it's summer's over. They've all been alive for a long time. And uh, they have to do that, obviously, because Sasami is not in the dream world. She's not on the field trip with them. So her route, I feel, probably does the best. And I mean, I'm, it's obvious now that I think about it, but it, it does the best job like at talking about the dream world. You know, sort of establishing the lore, if you will. I don't know. What do you think? Well, let's see. Uh, I still don't like Sasami's character, but I think that's just because of, like, this irrational detest I have for, uh, ooh, ooh, what are they called? Uh, Ojo-sama characters, I think? Oh, yeah, the Ojo-sama just... laugh. Oh, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, that God. thing. Uh, but, I mean, like, yeah, I didn't... Yeah, I would say I still dislike Sasami as a character, but, um, I think I've came very close to liking her through her route. Yeah, her uh, romance just, was pretty weak. Yeah. But uh, it did get it did get really personal with her and yeah. I like if there's one thing I do like about Ojo Sama characters, it's breaking down that royalty thing they have going on and just seeing who they are as a person. Yeah, and um the whole the whole route was interesting, um but the one scene that stuck with me 
was, uh, and of course I cried like a child, was when she was playing with the cat for the last time. And they describe in detail how it's the cat is slowly dying, but it's still doing its best to have fun. That hurt me. Uh, yeah, the ending of Sasami's route is really, really powerful. And, but, I don't know, I think it was... The problem here was that I said I was getting close to liking Sasami, but right around when I was about to say, okay, Sasami, I like you now, it stopped being about her as a character and just went into the final act of the arc that didn't really just have to do with her as a person. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose that would probably... Yeah, that, that would throw me off had I been in your shoes. Uh, but yeah, it was... For me, I guess the best way, and this will be on my last thought on it, is that Sasami's route is, it's okay. It's decent, it has a nice mystery element, the plot is okay, and then you get to the part with the cat, and suddenly it's one of my favorite routes. Like, that moment was just so well written. Shout out to Tonokawa, who also wrote Komari and Kuragaya. Oh, this is Tonokawa? Yeah. Oh, no, no wonder I I started liking her. Tonokawa can make me like anyone. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, Tonokawa wrote that one. And uh, Kanata's author, Chika Shirakiri, in case you couldn't tell by all of the exposition and length in her route, was the same author as Haruka and Kud. Oh. Yeah. All right, Um, I guess, yeah, now is the time. Crotenus, your time is now. Let's talk about Saya. This is, without a doubt, my favorite route in the visual novels, and one of my favorite routes in visual novels in general. W one of my favorite pieces of media and fiction in general would be the better way to put it. Everything about this route just feels so personal, so... It, it felt like Jun Maeda himself is speaking to you from his heart. Telling you a personal story of his, or maybe somebody he knew, I don't know. But it, it it's just so emotional. The build-up throughout the route, it just goes... Ugh. I tear up just thinking about it. Every I... every little thing that happens, that happens throughout the route is like, is done to make you feel for Saya, to make you relate to Saya, and then the big reveal comes and you just break yeah, down that in is, an emotion. That, that's my strongest praise for the Saya route, is the character writing, because she very much so comes out of nowhere. There's, there's nothing about Saya that really, you know... <sighs> it, yeah, she just comes out of nowhere. I don't have a better way to say it. And... She, she's very forced. She's very forced onto you because her route is self-contained. You start her route and you're locked out of everything else. However, she's written so well that even though you, like, you start to care about her like an hour into the route, it's, yeah, it's, I don't know, it's great. And, like, I'm not gonna say it's not, it's perfect because it's not there's there's a bit of some pacing issues and there's also like the minigame is really boring the the minigame is extremely boring and unfun you can choose to skip it i guess but it's not it, it it's just not not good and like the other ones like the baseball minigame was super fun um yeah it's but, really it's an acquired taste it's like a fine wine <laughs> nah, I didn't like it at all. <laughs> okay, I, I he's gone, so I can talk about I, I, it I really. So, I think the strongest point of the route is Saya's backstory. Like, the the forty last forty minutes of the route, when you when you are already in the room. And you, well, I'm not sure if this is the order of events because I had played it a long time ago. But when she starts telling you her, and like, he, he starts imagining her own backstory, remembering it. Like, everything about how her father was a doctor and she went through many countries. And 
it, it you start being like what is this what does this what, what does this mean to this route and then you eventually get to the point where you see she's dead she, she's dead or is dying there's nothing you can do to stop it this is no reference this is no mia's route or whatever she's dead you can't do anything about it it's just gonna happen it it doesn't matter what you try it doesn't matter what you think she, she just dies at the end, it's, you can say it's a bit open to the reader's interpretation, whether key magic happens. Oh, it's more than a bit open. <laughs> it, yeah, because it doesn't have that conclusive ending, but I think the, what it gives throughout the entire route, I think she, she that's heaven she's in. She's, it's her own personal heaven where she can relieve her life and be happy. Yeah, it, I it, guess... Um... I guess the only thing we have left to talk about is our interpretations of the ending. My interpretation of Saya's ending is that um she's yeah, she's she's dead the whole time. I I have no idea how she got in to the dream world because by all the laws of the dream world, you've got to be un unconscious but not dead. Um so I have no idea how she got in there. I have given up on trying to find out. Um, figure out, I should say. But my explanation of the ending is that Kyosuke understood, you know, and Saya needed to leave. She couldn't remain, but he understood. So I think what he did is she, he, he gave her her own secret world. And she, that as, as long as they were trapped in the secret world, going through all of the other routes, then Saya would have her own, where she could live the youth that she wanted to live. And because that would, you know, Saya would be happy, and then she also, you know, she wouldn't be in the picture anymore. She wouldn't interfere with Ricky and Rin. So that that's what I think. I think Kyosuke helped her out. You know, after she finally agreed, okay, I'll leave you guys alone, I think he was like, all right, but I feel for her. I gotta give her something. That's how I understand it. It's also partially out of denial. I just, I can't accept that Saya can have anything other than a happy ending. Yeah, <laughs> I can agree there. Also, I have a big question that I've always been confused. What's her age when, like, she dies? Like, in her, originally, I thought she was the same age as the general Little Busters. And that the reason she showed up in the dream was because she died. She like she was dying at the same time. They were all, and basically dying themselves if, for from the bus crash. That's what I originally thought. But after seeing a lot, a lot of other things, it leads me to believe that she maybe died earlier, and I, she was a kid. Yeah, I, I mean, it's yeah, it's all tough to understand. Than thirteen. Yeah, like they they draw her like she's nine during where she's crushed by the landslide um but you know they they have several sections of dialogue where it, she's obviously older she's a teenager now one of the other things do, do either of you guys remember where the landslide where does the landslide occur do either of you remember um, i didn't refresh on the ex routes uh, she, sure. here's the thing here's the thing if they don't specify then so that that could answer our question of how she gets in maybe the landslide occurs and that obviously causes a tremor and that is what causes their bus to flip over and drive off the cliff the bus wasn't wiped out in a landslide but obviously if there's a landslide that's going to cause some sort of tremor that's and if you're driving on a cliff with curvy roads a tremor is going to fuck you up it is very reasonable to think it would cause you to drive off the cliff what do you think the chances are that she would that, that she would die in a landslide that just so happens to be near enough to where the bus is at that exact moment to knock it off a cliff. Well, this is a visual novel. That's how I think it's possible. <laughs> yeah, it, it's fiction. They I can do whatever they want. Yeah. No, I mean, I would have a, a tough time getting behind it as well, but I just want Saya to be happy. So I, whatever works, I'm going to go for it. Otherwise, I'm just going to be sad. Also, you, uh, you just believe that she just accidentally got caught up in the world just by being close to it, if that were the case? Yeah, that could easily be the case. That explains how a wayward soul would somehow find its way in. I... 
one thing I want to mention. The best moment I've seen throughout the entire Bishop level, in my opinion, is that last scene when when she's holding the gun up to her head and crying. The moment I, I saw that scene, to... well, well, I'm, I'm gonna, I actually didn't cry after playing Saga's Fruit because what happened is I had. Okay, let me explain myself. <laughs> I had played through Sasami the same day, the entirety of Sasami through the oh, same so day. Oh, so you were already and, jaded. You were already yeah, I, just... <laughs> I, I was empty inside, and it was like 3 a.m., so I didn't feel anything. There were no tears but, to cry because you'd already yeah. wasted them all. Exactly, you but what happens is... All of Lucia route. <laughs> two hours, like two months later, maybe, I'm not sure, I decided I went... Hey, let's listen to some Little Buster sending themes because I like uh, Song for Friends and all that shit. And I listened to Saya's song and I just... Suddenly you were like, uh oh, uh oh, Scoob, something, it's bad. Something broke within me and I just died. Yeah, it was the dam. I, I can completely I, understand that. So, uh, I... The, so the last time I experienced the EX routes was a little over a year ago. I have not rewatched them. I did not even... Like, because prior to this podcast, since it's been so long since I'd experienced Little Busters, I refreshed myself on all of the routes by going and reading up on them. But I skipped over the EX routes because I'm just like, nah, there'll be people there to cover for me. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, like, so I downloaded the Little Busters soundtrack uh, a month ago. And when I was listening to it, then Saya's song comes on. And if it had been nearly a year since I'd last heard this song, I didn't remember it at all. And it still broke me hearing it. Yep, it hurts me too. It, it, it's like so personal. It, it just, it speaks to you on, from heart to heart. It, it, it's weird. Yeah. It's, it's a Mida song at but, its finest. Yeah, that's just, that's just Key's music, man. It, it sticks with you. All right, well, I suppose that does it. That That's Little Busters. I'm, I'm glad you guys could join me, since obviously you were, you were not here when we first did it. But now you've been able to. You've been able to talk about this work that is very special to you. I was glad to be a part of it. Glad to host. You got any final thoughts to leave with the listeners or me? Thank Saya you is I best girl. Thanks, Tennis. <laughs> well, <laughs> what's up, Austin? Your turn. I said, thank you all for a year of Kaniku. Here's to another more. Yeah, if I don't end everything by then. If Rini doesn't kill himself yeah, by then. If I don't obliterate uh, the figments of my imagination. If I don't find some sort of bioweapon in this lab. All if right. you don't decide it's not enough yeah if I, if I decide it's enough <laughs> alright well everybody say bye goodbye bye. we're the only two people left <laughs> we're all alone alright thanks we'll catch y'all later